morning, everyone, and welcome to our church service this morning. A big welcome to you all, and a special welcome to our visitors. We have a saying in the congregation that as soon as you walk through those doors, we regard you as being part of the family. So welcome to the family. We hope that you enjoy the service with us today. This week, the eldest member of our church, Tisha Marshall, who was 104, passed away. So let us just remember her and her family in a special prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we come to thank you for coming to fetch Tisha softly and peacefully. We ask, Lord, that you be with her children and her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren and that you will offer them comfort and support peace and strength during this time as they begin to organize memorial teas and celebrations of Tisha's life. But we also ask that you carry them particularly as in a few weeks time she would have turned 105. We ask Lord that you be with them now and always. Amen. I have spoken to Sally, Tisha's daughter, and we are arranging a memorial tea at Damant Lodge. When those details are organized, we will let the session know, who will let the members know of when that service, uh, that memorial tea will take place. Ndia Nibulisa, Nonke Gegama, Lenko Seyetu Uyezu Christu, Akhrutela Alke and Ninon Fanonsiera Jesus Christus. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's begin with a song of praise as we sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 91, verse 14 and 15. And here the poet writes, 
writes on God's words that says, Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him. For he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. We call all come together here this morning because we have one thing in common. We believe. We believe that God loves us and knows us. We believe that in this past week, in those moments we cried out, the Lord heard us. In those moments we were vulnerable or hurt. God comforted us. We believe that in those moments we had peace and pure joy and enough strength. It was moments when God's grace was poured over us. And so we come to praise God, to worship Him, to connect to Him. So let's focus with thanksgiving on those moments where God was with us this past week, where we experienced God in the rainbows, in the sunrises, in the ocean waves, and even in the wind. Let's open our hearts and our minds to God's presence in silent and individual prayer. Let's pray. Our holy and awesome God, we come to sing your praises. We come to sing of your might and power, your understanding and compassion, your care. We come to thank you for the blessings of sustenance, protection, provision and grace that we received from your hand in this past week. We come, Lord, because we yearn for your presence and we seek your face. So we come, just as we are to meet you, to sit before your cross, to share with you what's happening in our lives. You know us well, Lord. You know our problems, our challenges, our issues, our worries. You know what type of week we had and what the week ahead has in store for us. You know our hurts, pains, problems. And you know our sin. You know when we are quick to judge, quick to say the wrong thing, quick to gossip, quick to attack. You know when we are slow to have compassion, slow to walk a mile in another's shoes, slow to think of how what we say affects others. You know, Lord, those moments we are selfish, entitled, moments our pride and ego are so inflated that we see nothing else. You know those moments where we are wrong and stubborn about it. You know when our words, our thoughts, our actions, our attitudes do not reflect you. And so we fall before your cross as we silently and individually come to confess our sin to you.
Lord, as we come before you, we are aware of our brokenness. And we stand in awe of your goodness. As we think about our wrong actions, we stand in awe of your forgiveness and understanding. As we become, as we become aware of how far we fall short of your heavenly vision, we humbly approach you to ask, forgive us, have mercy upon us. If our confessions are acceptable in your holy sight, then please, Lord, cleanse us, pardon us, restore us, and forgive us. Take away our trespasses and renew us, so that we may grow to be more like Christ day after day and moment after moment. We fall upon your cross of grace as we repent. We are sorry. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, grace, and mercy. Thank you that we can come to worship today to connect to you and meet you. Holy Spirit, come and move among us. Transform our inmost being. Speak to us in ways we can understand. Move within us and among us so that your presence can be experienced by us all. Come and teach us and equip us for what we need in this week to come. We yearn for you, Lord. Meet us, we pray. Amen. We're now going to stand and we're going to sing four verses from the hymn, And Can It Be?
chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed me. Lectionary reading this comes from Genesis 45, verse 1 to 15, and Marilyn Pattenton will read that for us today. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now, hurry back to my father and say to him, This is what your son, sorry, I'm lost, your, your son Joseph says, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have. I will provide you for you there, because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them, and afterwards his brothers talked with him. May God bless to us this reading from his holy word, and to his name be all glory and praise. For the last few Sundays... We've systematically worked through different passages in the book of Genesis. We started out 
by looking at the great patriarch Jacob, who was later renamed as Israel. And we learned about who he was, what he did, and how his relationship with God formed and developed over the years. And then last week we started a journey in the Joseph cycle. And we find the patriarch Joseph's stories in Genesis 37 to 50. So naturally last week we started with Genesis 37. However, last week's portrayal of Joseph, Joseph came as a bit of a shock to some of us. Because he wasn't quite as we remembered from the childhood Bible that mom and dad used to read us or that the Sunday school teacher used to teach us. Because instead we learned that Joseph was a little bit of a tattletale, spoiled little brat. And suddenly we had some understanding for his older brothers. And then we read how they chucked him in a pit and sold him off to the traveling Ishmaelites. Now our reading this morning picks up again the story of Joseph and his brothers. But so much has happened between last week's reading and this week's reading. We missed the whole story of how Joseph went from the pit to the palace. So let's take a moment to catch up, shall we? In Genesis 39, we discover that Joseph started rising to a position of power as he became the overseer of the slaves. He was handsome and successful. So handsome and successful, in fact, that Pontifer's wife made some advances at him. But he declined. And because he said no, she laid a false charge of sexual assault and Joseph ended up in prison. In chapters 40 and 41, we read that Joseph was still very skilled in interpreting dreams. And after interpreting a dream for the cupbearer and the baker that worked in the Pharaoh's household, eventually he was called to interpret one of Pharaoh's dreams. And based on Pharaoh's dream, he advises the leader to store up 20% of the harvest in the seven years of abundance. So that when the seven years of famine comes, there will be enough food in the land. And of course, it will assist Egypt to quickly rise to power. Pharaoh makes Joseph the guy to oversee all of this. And by the end of chapter 41, we read that Joseph had gained authority over the whole of Egypt. So all in all, it looked like Joseph was doing pretty well in his job. He had rose from the pit to the palace. But then comes chapter 42, where Joseph's work life and family life collide. Because meanwhile back in Canaan, Jacob, or rather Israel's whole household, faced starvation. They heard there's food in Egypt. And so Israel tells his sons to go to Egypt to buy grain. And when Joseph sees his brothers, he recognizes them immediately. And at that very moment, his whole life is properly turned upside down. Because suddenly he's faced with the very people who sold him. The very people who betrayed him. The very people who hurt him deeply. And now the question is, what's he going to do about it? How is he going to react? He's no longer the vulnerable boy in the pit. He's the mighty man in the palace. And he has an opportunity to punish them or forgive them, to have his revenge or to let it go. But how Joseph reacts is interesting because it shows us another side of Joseph, a side that's complex and a side 
that many of us can relate to even though we don't like to admit it. Because Joseph begins by pretending to not know who they are. He doesn't know them. He even goes so far as to get an interpreter so that he doesn't have to speak Hebrew to them. He then accuses them of spying, throws them in jail for three days. He demands that after they take their grain home, that they must return with a younger brother, Benjamin. And while he waits for them to come back with Benjamin, he keeps one of his other brothers, Simeon, locked up, just as a guarantee. He then sneaks money into that they paid for the grain back into their bags and when the brothers discover it they are terrified because now not only do they have spying charges against them but they might have stealing charges too. And when they get home they tell their father and he refuses that neither Benjamin or the brothers are going back to Egypt. He can't lose another son. He's now lost Joseph and Simeon. But the inevitable happens. They run out of food. And in chapter 43 and 44, they return to Egypt for grain. They have no choice. And if they want the man in control of the grain, Joseph, to take kindly to them, they must take Benjamin with them. So they set off. They arrive in Egypt, nervous, scared, full of anxiety. How does Joseph react now? Well, Joseph continues his games. He tells one of his servants to take the brothers home and prepare a feast for them, but he doesn't tell his brothers this. They think he knows about the money, and now, the hort is gaar. When Joseph finally meets up with them, he sees Benjamin. And he needs to leave the room because he started crying. So he washes his face, he takes control of his emotions again, and he comes back to eat, making sure Benjamin sits next to him and gets five times more than anybody else. And rather than taking this moment to reveal his true identity to the family, instead he slips his own silver cup into Benjamin's sack, setting him up for a charge of stealing. The next morning, Joseph's security team goes out to go through the bags, searches it, and alas, there they find Joseph's cup in Benjamin's bag, and everybody is dragged back to Joseph. Now we need to understand the power that Joseph had here. Everyone and anyone who wanted to eat needed to come to Joseph. He was the man with the grain. He decided who can buy it and for how much. The whole world around them were hungry. The famine was everywhere. And if Joseph said no to you, you would starve. And it's here to this powerful man where Judah the brother who came up with the idea in the first place to sell him to the Ishmaelites, where he stands up to try and protect Benjamin. And in a very moving speech, Judah describes how he swore to his father that he will bring Benjamin back. He tells Joseph that their father has already lost a beloved son, and if he loses another one, it will mean the end of him. He will die from the grief. Judah then offers himself as a slave in the place of Benjamin because Benjamin must go home. And here our story this morning then begins. Now knowing all of this background what are your thoughts about Joseph? Is he a good guy or a bad guy? Is he a hurt man who's acting from a place of pain or damage or brokenness? 
Is he filled with rage and revenge? If we were in Joseph's shoes, with all the feelings he's feeling, what would we have done honestly? After Joseph hears the words of brother Judah, what happens? Joseph loses control. He chases everybody out and he starts to weep. Now we need to note that Joseph wasn't someone who easily lost control. Throughout the stories of his life, Joseph consistently displays control during times filled with much pressure. When Pontifar's wife tries to seduce him, he remains in control. When he's in prison and disappointed time and time again that he can't get out, he remains in control. When he comes in the presence of Pharaoh and tells him what his dream means, even though the Pharaoh might not like the explanation, he remains in control. And then suddenly here, he loses it. And he weeps so loudly that all those who he just chased away could hear him. Now Joseph is no stranger to crying. He cries in chapter 42 and 43. But here he has an ugly cry of biblical proportions. It's a cry that comes out of the depths of his soul. It's a cry that he doesn't plan to have. But why does Joseph have this ugly cry? Was he sad? Was he filled with joy? Was it a cry that just cleansed his emotions? Was it a cry that liberated and freed all the emotions that he had felt through the years? Did they finally just come bursting out? But why now? Because it suddenly becomes clear to Joseph that Judah and his brothers have changed. The men standing in front of him are no longer the same men who sold him into slavery so many years ago. From Judah's response to Joseph, when Joseph wanted to keep Benjamin, we learn a few things about the brothers. It's clear that they had felt guilty about what they had done to Joseph. It's clear they, that when they saw the suffering of their father because of the alleged death of his favorite son, they knew they were the cause of it. It's clear that now they do not envy or hate the fact that Benjamin is the favorite and occupy a special place in his father's heart. Instead of jumping onto the opportunity to get rid of Benjamin just like they got rid of Joseph, Judah instead fights for Benjamin. He fights so hard for Benjamin that he is willing to give up himself. Take me as a slave instead, he says. I don't want my father to suffer anymore. And it is this that sparks Joseph's overwhelming feelings. And it's these feelings that cause Joseph to tell the truth of who he is to his brothers. All pretenses, tricks, manipulations, schemes, revenge plans and paybacks are over. Joseph speaks in Hebrew. And the first words he says is, I am Joseph. And immediately he tries to figure out if his dad's still alive. But his brothers are too dumbfounded to speak. They stare at him, unable to comprehend the words that they just heard. And then Joseph does something completely out of character. He tells them, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me. God sent me before you to preserve life. In this moment where Joseph cries, we see a transformation that happens within him. He moves from a position of authority and power 
to a position of dialogue. Those moments of resentment, manipulation and revenge is gone, making way for acceptance and hope. Joseph wants to reconcile and restore his family. But what is also interesting is that in this moment, suddenly a lot of things make sense to Joseph. The fact that his brothers sold him, the fact that he spent time in jail, the fact that he continued to use the gift God gave him to interpret dreams, all of this was God bringing good out of bad to ensure that Jacob, the one God promised to look after, was still looked after even in a famine. Because when we look at Joseph's life, we see someone who really faced one struggle after another. He lost his beloved Rachel next to the road while she gave birth. He lost the oldest son Rachel gave him, Joseph, through what he thought was a wild animal attack. And as an aging man, he was socially disgraced when his daughter was violated. And yet through all of that, God was with him. Joseph was left in a pit. He was sold into slavery. He was tempted by Pontifer's wife, but stood strong and ended up in jail because of it. He used the gift God gave him to decipher dreams, which led him to a position of power where he could ensure food for many. And through it all, God was with him. The brothers, who were initially jealous and filled with envy, who did the unthinkable of selling their own flesh and blood into slavery, who saw how their actions caused their father to suffer, who saw how their father wasted away after their sister was abused, who played their role in losing land because they went after those who hurt their sister, all contributed to them now suffering because of the famine. But through it all, God was with them. So throughout our lives, God is with us. Even when things don't go the way we want them to or go the way we plan. Today, we are inducting a new elder. Even though we say new, Liz has been an elder before. She took a much deserved break and now she's ready to take up her role of servant once again in this congregation. Being an elder is not easy. It's not easy to serve the people of God. Often elders are hurt by what people say and by what people do. Sometimes elders are hurt by what people don't say and don't do. Elders are sometimes blamed for not visiting enough and even for visiting too much not phoning enough and also phoning too often, not communicating clearly enough but also communicating too much. But elders, believers, people of God, brothers and sisters, our reading today reminds us that we are here to serve one another. And as we go through the ups and downs of life, God is with us. But this reading is also a challenge to us to be less like the Joseph who wants revenge, less like the Joseph who wants to inflict pain and hurt because he was hurt and in pain, less like the Jacob who wants uh, the Joseph who wants to play games. 
and to be more like the Joseph who is willing to forgive. More like the Joseph who is willing to try and work for reconciliation. More like the Joseph who works for unity and peace within the family of God. May God be with us and equip us to do just that in this week to come. Amen. Let us pray. Our Lord God, you know the pain and the hurt we carry within our hearts. You know the heaviness that sits in our soul. You know the scars we have and the brokenness we experience because of what others have said or did. Lord, you also know the pain and the hurt we caused, the heaviness in others that we are responsible for and the brokenness that we need to take responsibility for because of what we said and did. Lord, come and help us to make amends and say sorry where we went wrong, but also help us to let go and forgive those who we need to. Forgiveness, Lord, we know is a process, but equip us in this process and show us what to do, when to do it and how to do it. We are here, Lord, because we want to serve you. Serving you, Lord, means we also need to serve one another. But this isn't easy for us. And most often than not, it doesn't come naturally to us. So, Lord, come and equip us to serve one another. Come and show us what to do, when to do it, how to do it, so that we can be used by you in your kingdom. Lord, you know the mountain tops we find ourselves on. Thank you for your blessings, your provision. Thank you for the moments in our lives where all is well and doing well. All glory to you, Lord above lords and God above gods. But Lord, you also know the valleys we are currently walking through, the mud we get stuck in, the overwhelming dread we feel, the anxiety that comes to sit in the pit of our stomachs and the tiredness we experience. Lord, come and be with us. Come and walk beside us. Come and grant us strength and peace and healing as you console and comfort us every step of the way. We pray, Lord, for those who are grieving and mourning those who are ill and awaiting test results, those who are going in for treatments and tests and scans, those who are worried about something that may happen this week, those who are needing to make difficult decisions, those who are facing great challenges, those who are feeling lost and battling financially, those who are preparing to say their goodbyes or who are excited to say their hellos. Lord, be with us all. Watch over us in this week to come and be close to us now and forever. Amen. This morning is a special moment for our congregation because we induct Liz Coombe Heath into our eldership. In the UPCSA, which is the Uniting Presbyterian Church of Southern Africa, which is the church that we are part of, elders are obliged to be faithful in the study of scripture and prayer, to live holy lives, to govern, guide and assist in the maintenance of the life of the congregation, and to participate in the fellowship and work of the session. They are to subject themselves to the authority and discipline of our church, and to seek its unity and peace at all times. The elders have the role to care for the congregation, especially those in their districts, which means that they need to visit in good times and in bad times, to pray at all times, to encourage us in the moments we are weak and filled with despair, and to laugh with us when things are going well. Together the session needs to discern God's will for the congregation and guide us with love, understanding and kindness. 
as members of this congregation, we also have a responsibility towards our elders. When they ask to come and visit, we must welcome them. When they want to pray for us, we must pray for them also. When we are going through difficult times or happy times, we need to share that news with our elder. If we are unhappy about something, we need to make an appointment with our elder and discuss it. The elders can only support us as much as we allow them to. In our denomination, the Uniting Presbyterian Church of Southern Africa, a person is ordained as an elder once. So if someone's never been an elder before, they will first be ordained to be set apart as a leader in this denomination. An induction into eldership occurs after ordination or after someone had been an elder before. It takes time to rest before being called to serve again. This morning, Liz has been called up to serve our congregation again after taking some time to rest. And so, brothers and sisters in the Lord, there are different spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit who gives them, gives them so that we can serve the same God. There are different activities we do, but the same God who works through them. In each of us, the Spirit is shown at work in the common good. We have gifts that differ according to what is given to us by God's grace. And as members of the one body of Christ, we are called to exercise those gifts to build up our body for the mission of this world. One gift is the gift of leadership. And if you are a leader, says Paul, lead with enthusiasm. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of a double honor. Those who are chosen to be elders and leaders are called to care for God's people and exercise oversight over them. Liz, would you please come and join me at the front? Thank you for being willing to serve us again. And so we have one question for you. Do you accept the office of elder of this congregation? And do you promise faithfully to discharge the duties of an elder in it? Could you hear her at the back? No, good. Let us pray. Almighty God, bless Liz and the elders of this congregation, whom you have called and your people have chosen. May they faithfully rule, lead, and serve in your church. May they exercise oversight over it, not out of mere obligation, but willingly and eagerly as you want, not domineering over those in your keeping, but being an example to the flock. Lord, strengthen them and guide them by your Holy Spirit to serve and witness in this generation according to your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, God's anointed, holy, sacred, crucified, risen, and exalted on high, I declare you, Liz Coombe Heath, to be an elder inducted into our session. May the God of peace, the great shepherd, be with you, equip you, look after you, strengthen you and grant you peace and love as you work with his flock. In recognition of Liz being called as an elder, I would like to invite the active session members to please come and give Liz the right hand of fellowship. That means come and shake her hand. <laughs> Elders, can you so much stay in front here, please? We are now going to ask all the elders who are in active service of this session to re 
knew their vows of ordination, to remind them of the promises that they made before God and also this congregation. But it also serves to remind us as members what the duty of our elders are. So together, elders, will you please read the vows you, some of you, made many, many years ago. I own and confess for I was my Father, Jesus Christ, as my Saviour and Lord, and, Lord, and, and the Holy Spirit as my Father. As far as I know my own heart, I do thy zeal for the glory of God, love of the Lord Jesus Christ, the call of the Holy Spirit, the commission to witness to the coming of God's kingdom on earth, and a desire for the salvation of all more people. I accept the word of God in the scriptures of the old and new testament as the final rule of faith in my life. I accept the subordinate standards of faith of the apostles and the master and the priests. I accept the substance of the faith expressed in the confession of faith of the United Presbyterian Church in South Africa and the declaration of faith for the church in Southern Africa. In the way that the declaration of saints sets out, I acknowledge the doctrine and form of government of the United Presbyterian Church in Southern Africa to accord with Scripture. I promise to be loyal to this church, to accept its authority, to apply by its laws and discipline, and to encourage other members to do the same. I will serve as commissioned in the ruling councils and seek its unity and peace. With God's help, I undertake to be regular in your worship, faithful in the study of Scripture, and in prayer, and holy in my own life, so that I have set an example to all. I will share with diligence and compassion the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. He has anointed you to tell the gospel to the poor. He sent you to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and to announce the time of our Lord's salvation. God be with you. Thank you, elders. You can all sit except for Marilyn. You can come and join me, Marilyn. As we all know, our session clock, Marilyn, took a leave of absence when it was the birth of her first grandchild. And so for the past few months, she's been enjoying her new role as grandmother. And it's during this time, after much prayer and pondering, after many discussions with the family, that she decided that the time has come for her to permanently move back to KZN. And so we have reached this Sunday, a Sunday where she is joining us for the last time as our session clock. Marilyn, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for this congregation. As soon as you became a member, you joined the choir and you blessed us with the gift of your voice, Sunday after Sunday, carol service after carol service. You immediately saw the need we had for somebody to take ownership for decorating the liturgical area. And soon, all the new beautiful banners and stoles were created in every color for every season. You even went as far to make Christmas Day services, even if you weren't here, extra special because of all the work you put in it 
so that it could be symbolic re symbolically rich not only for us adults, but also for the children who would join us. When we came to knock on your door to become an elder, after prayer, you said yes. And when the time came when Errol Parsons stepped down from session clerk, you were willing to step up to do all the extra admin. You will leave a very big hole in our congregation and also in our session. We are sad that you want to move, but we understand your choice and support your decision to be granny full time. So thank you for everything. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for Marilyn. Thank you for the gifts you gave her, for the skills you developed within her, for equipping her as she came to serve you in this congregation. We pray that you will walk with her as she moves back, moves back to KZN. We ask that you will help her find a new spiritual home, that you will bless her in her new responsibilities as granny, and that you will equip her, grant her strength, be close to her, and grant her peace all the days to come. Watch over her and protect her. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Here we have um, your transfer letter to the congregation of your choice with a little thank you note and a, and a chocolate. <laughs> thank you for everything. Yes. Do you want my mic? Yeah. I would like to say this. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> that will be the last time for a while, I think. So when Christelle was told me that there would be a little farewell today, uh, she asked me whether I wanted to say anything, and I, my first thing was, no, I don't think so. But actually I do, because I really want to thank you all for being the wonderful congregation and for all the incredible fellowship I've had during my seven and almost eight years here now. When I first walked into the church at the beginning of 2016, after having tried a few others, I was met at the door by an elder, I can't remember who it was, but I remember Errol standing there, and he enveloped me in this hug. You know, an Errol hug? And a little bit further in was Glenn Craig. Behind him was Cheryl. He enveloped me in another Glenn hug. And I thought, my goodness me. And then I walked further into the church, and I thought, oh, oh, I feel, I feel a vibe. I feel... I felt I'd come home. It was the most wonderful thing because I used to belong to the Presbyterian, well, it was called just the Presbyterian Church in those days, in um, Amtali, in Amotari, in Zimbabwe. And we had been such a family. The minister was Scottish, he hauled us into everything, but everything we did in our social life revolved around the church. And once we had emigrated to South Africa, I did not find that until Port Alfred. So there was 40 something years where I never found that same fellowship. And so I want to say thank you to you all for being the very special people you are, for the many, many privileges I've had of being in the choir, singing with Basil Maker. I mean, really, what a joy to sing with Basil. His musicality and that voice, wow, I'll never forget it. To be involved with making the banners, I mean, yeah, that, that was great fun. Thank you, Christelle, for letting me fly with my crazy ideas sometimes. To the ladies in the knitting club who even took my jerseys that were, had arms that were far too long, but relegated to, me knit, to knitting rugs thereafter. Um, to the ladies' guild for the, the special times I had with you. And, well, just to the session. I mean, the session has been a very interesting um, walk with, um, with you. To Crystal and Zola, I have learned a great deal about how the Uniting Presbyterian Church works. And to the Stewardship Committee, I just have to say, you have a really caring Stewardship Committee. 
your finances are in good hands. And as for the fundraising ladies, my word. So thank you, everybody, for, I'm not going to single anyone out, <laughs> but really, it's been wonderful. You have a very special place in my heart. And I have gone to the Presbyter United Presbyterian Church in Howick. It's about 260 people um, who struggle to find a parking. And um, we'll see how that goes. But I have already found a church to go to that's close. And I hope to find a similar sort of family that I've found here. So thank you very much. On that note, we are going to have some tea and eats after the church service. So you're more than welcome to stay for a cup of tea and... Um, like us for like a so you're more than welcome to stay. We are now going to sing our last hymn, which is Brother Sister, Let Me Serve You, and then we're going to remain standing for the benediction, and then we're going to take hands and move from side to side as we sing a benediction over one another, and then we are going to remain standing for the exit of the Bible. So let us stand and sing together, Brother Sister, Let Me Serve. Balo lenko si yetu u Yesu Kristu utando luka tiko obutlelwana lo moyo u yentwele malube nani nonke en nou mag die genade van Christus die liefde van God en die gemeenskap van die Heilige Gees sal met elkeen van julle wees en bly en nou met the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love, now and forevermore. Amen.